The first month of the Great War is coming to its end. During the time, the Grand Fleet of the Royal Navy was still seeking the chance for a battle with the High Sea Fleet in the North Sea. A proposal was delivered to the Admiralty by Commodore Reginald Tyrwhitt, commander of the Howitz destroyer flotilla, and Commodore Roger Keyes, the commander of the submarine forces of Howitz. Keyes' forces has been patrolling the German waters since the beginning of the war. Therefore, he knew by heart the habits and movements of the light vessels around Hitlergoland. The proposal planned to use a few British submarines as bait to attract the patrolling German destroyers, which would provide the other submarines, along with Turwitz destroyers and light cruisers, the opportunity to attack. However, this proposal did not impress the Admiralty's war staff, which was at the time led by Vice Admiral Frederick Sturdy. Thus, on August the 23rd, Keith went straight to the first sea lord, Winston Churchill. Churchill approved his initiative. With the support of the first sea lord, the Admiralty passed the proposal the next day with some changes to it. The operation was scheduled for August the 28th. It was clear that the plan was risky since the British are exposing about 50 light combat ships within a short distance of Wiedheimshafen. Due to this reason, both Keyes and Turwitz requested the support of the Grand Fleet, yet Sturdy did not agree. He allowed only New Zealand and the Invincible to be positioned 40 miles northwest of Heligoland, with four armored cruisers further to the west. On the 26th, the submarines left the port. One day later, in the morning of the 27th, 32 destroyers and the light cruisers HMS Arethusa and HMS Fearless joined under the lead of Commodore Turwitz. The commander-in-chief of the British Grand Fleet, Admiral John Jellico, was not informed of an operation this size until the 26th of August, the day that the submarines left the port. After he overheard the operation, he was appalled and immediately asked the Admiralty for more detail. In addition, he told the Admiralty that if there were no other missions scheduled, he would sail with the Grand Fleet on the 27th to support the operation. Vice Admiral Sturdy again replied that the support of the Grand Fleet would not be needed. However, Admiral Jellico was still able to send the Lion, the Queen Mary, and the Princess Royal to support the Invincible and the New Zealand immediately. Therefore, Jellico sent the three battlecruisers, led by Rear Admiral Beatty, which were escorted by Commodore Goodenough's six cruisers of the 1st Light Cruiser Squadron, to support the operation. Including the two battlecruisers assigned earlier, the British reinforcement was now composed of 11 ships. At 5 a.m. of the 27th, Beatty and Goodenough fleet left Scapa Flow, followed by the Grand Fleet under the command of Admiral Jellico, who reported to the Admiralty about the three battlecruisers sent to enforce turrets after all ships were at sea. The Admiralty did not attempt to notify turrets and keys about the reinforcements until 13 o'clock. Even worse, the two Commodores never got the message. The message was sent to Harwich and never reached the ships at sea. Commodore Turwitz did not know about the reinforcements until the dawn of the 28th, which was just before the battle. Commodore Keyes, on the other hand, was notified even later and in a much more dangerous way. When Keyes' flagship, HMS Lurcher, finally met Goodenough's cruisers sometimes after 8.15 of the 28th, she mistook them as German ships. Now to the battle itself. At 7 o'clock of August 28, 1914, the British cruiser Arethusa spotted the German destroyer G194 three miles to Port Bow. This was the first real naval contact between the two opposing forces since the start of the war. The German destroyer turned toward Helgoland at once, yet was pursued by four British destroyers. The captain of the G194 reported his contact with the Royal Navy to his superior, Rear Admiral Lebrecht Maas, who was the commanding officer of the High Sea Fleet destroyers. Maas signaled Admiral Hipper, who was at the time not only the commander of the German battlecruisers, but also the one in charge of the defense of the Heligoland Bight. Yet the low tide prevented the main combat ships of the German Navy from leaving the yard until noon. Thus, the German destroyers initially can only rely on the support of the light cruisers SMS Fraunlob and SMS Setting, which were already on station. 
The first part of the 1914 Battle of Heligoland Golan Bight was quite chaotic. The fight developed into chases and short skirmishes hampered by haze. The British had turrets, two cruisers and some destroyers, while the German had the front lobbed setting along with some destroyers and minesweepers. A few minutes before 8, the setting was spotted coming from north of Heligoland by Turwitz's flagship, the Arethusa. Turwitz altered his course and engaged the incoming German cruiser. While he was doing so, the front log was also spotted. The Arethusa was now under attack of two ships. Yet by 8.05, the setting has entered the range of HMS Fearless, and the German cruiser turned back and sailed towards Heligoland Island. The first part of the battle ended about 8.15, with the German ships closing in to Heligoland Island and the British forced to retreat to avoid the coastal guns. At this moment, HMS Arethusa, Fraunlob, and three German destroyers are damaged. Shortly after turning west, Turwitz's ships met six German destroyers that were returning to Heligoland after their patrol mission. The German destroyers fled south, yet the flotilla leader, V-187, unexpectedly encountering two cruisers of the Good Enough Squadron coming from the northwest. Therefore, she was forced to turn back to the direction of Turwitz. Surrounded and fired on by eight British destroyers, the V-187 sank at 9.10. Followed by this event was an extremely chaotic and confused phase for the British ships. This was caused by the Admiralty's delay in informing Turwitz and Keyes about the reinforcements of good enough six cruisers. Turwitz was only informed of the five reinforcing battlecruisers, while Keyes, as stated earlier, did not know about the reinforcements at all. As a result, the British submarine E6 mistook HMS Southampton as a German cruiser. The submarine launched two torpedoes at her. The torpedoes nearly hit the friendly cruiser, and the E6 was later almost rammed by HMS Southampton. At 10.15, Turwitz decided to again advance west, recalling his destroyers. The Fearless was ordered to provide cover for the Arethusa, which was undergoing temporary repair due to being damaged earlier during the battle with the Frown Lob. By 10.40, the Arethusa recovered to being able to steam at 20 knots, just in time to face the German reinforcements. By then, three cruisers, the Köln, the Strasbourg, and the Ariadne, had left Wiedheimshafen. While at 10 o'clock, SMS Mainz left the Ems estuary, which was about 35 miles west, attempting to cut off the British retreat. As mentioned earlier, Rear Admiral Lebrecht Maas signaled the commander of the German battlecruisers, Admiral Hipper, about the incoming British ships three hours ago. By 8.50, Hipper has already requested permission to send out the two battlecruisers, Moltke and von der Tann. The two ships by now are raising steam, yet the low tide prevented them from leaving the Yard Bar. So the German cruisers have to wait some more before they can get support from the capital ship. At 11 o'clock, the Redusa was spotted by the German ships and was fired on first by the Strasbourg. Yet the Strasbourg was forced to retreat after a torpedo attack by the British destroyers. The Redusa was then fired on by the Kong, yet the Kong retreated due to the same reason. Commodore Turwitz has mistaken the Kong as an armor cruiser. Therefore, he asked for the support from Beatty's battlecruisers, which was at the time 40 miles to the northwest. Beatty hesitated to provide support, but for a reason. Beatty feared that the German capital ships would catch him by surprise under the cover of the mist at the shoreline. In addition, he would be exposing his ships to the threats of mines and submarines, both German and British. Commodore Key's submarines were not aware of the presence of his battlecruisers in this area. Yet pressed by Turwitz's request, I feared that further hesitation may lead to serious repercussion for the Harwich force, Beatty finally decided to engage at 11.35, ordering the battlecruisers to steam full speed southeast. After turning west again, Turwitz was fired on by the mines, which disengaged after a short time to avoid Goodenough's cruiser coming from the northwest. The mines turned a uh, retreat south, yet only found herself running into Turwitz's destroyer squadron. The fight quickly began and soon three destroyers were damaged. The mines on the other hand was also critically damaged. She was hit several times by destroyer guns and took a hit from the British torpedo. The mines was ordered to be scuttled at 12.20 and sank after 40 minutes, taking 89 men with her below the waves.
As the Strasbourg and the Com began their second round attack on the Arethusa and the British destroyers, Beatty's battlecruisers arrived. To call the writing from a destroyer officer, there, straight ahead of us, a lovely procession, like elephants walking through a pack of dogs, came Lion, Queen Mary, Princess Royal, the Vincible, and the New Zealand. Great and grim and uncouth, like Andalusian monsters. How solid they look! How utterly earthquaking! And just a little later, we heard the thunder of their guns. Accurate fire of the steel elephants put Kong out of action and forced the Strasbourg to retreat in a number of minutes. By 1226, the battlecruiser spotted the light cruiser Ariadne ahead. The Lion and the Princess Royal fired on her and left her enveloped by flames. After being abandoned, the Ariadne sank at 1510. After sighting German mines around 1310, Beatty ordered his battlecruisers to turn north to avoid being too close to Heligoland and the German naval base. The squadron started to advance west. As HMS Lion was altering course, she sighted the Kong, which had retreated northeast after the first fight. In mere minutes, the Kong was reduced to a wreck by her heavy guns, and by 1325, the Kong carried Rear Admiral Le Brechmas and about 500 men to the bottom of the North Sea. Thanks to poor visibility, the other German cruisers were able to escape from the British battlecruisers. By 1410, Beatty's battlecruisers were on their way home, but there's still a problem left. Where are the German battlecruisers? Well, the Moltke and the Von der Tan has finally left the Yard Bar by 1410, just as the British left. They received contact from the retreating German cruisers by 1425, Yet Admiral Hipper, in the satellites one hour astern, ordered the two ships not to engage the enemy. From 1510 to 16 o'clock, Hipper searched the waters for the missing German ships, yet found nothing. By the evening, the German battlecruisers returned to Wilhelmshaven. The battle ended with the Germans losing three cruisers and one destroyed, with 712 men lost and 336 captured. The British, on the other hand, only had the casualty of 35 men. To conclude, the 1914 Battle of Heligoland started with poor communication on the British side. The Admiralty failed to inform Admiral Jalico and the two Commodores about the necessary information, which caused serious confusion and almost led to a loss of cruiser by friendly torpedo. In addition, if the Admiralty had not allowed Jalico to send Betty and good enough squadrons, the operation might have turned out quite differently. The most significant mistake on the German side was to send the cruisers one by one without waiting to concentrate a stronger force. The German battlecruisers were hampered by the tide, therefore did not arrive in time to support the light cruisers. However, even if they did arrive in time, the British would still have an advantage in numbers. Thank you for watching, sources are all in the description. If you like this video, please like, subscribe and share.